Welcome back to God's Temple of Truth. We're looking now at patriarchs in the sanctuary. We saw in the previous presentation how Moses moved through the sanctuary. Moses and Israel. Now we're going to look at other patriarchs. Can we see other patriarchs somewhere in the sanctuary? Well, there's many, but I've only got time to do a few. So we're going to have to move quite quickly through these, so bear with me. Let me go back to the uh, two presentations ago when I showed you, I discussed with you the pillars in the temple. Do you remember the Pentateuch in the Old Testament harmonizing with the four Gospels of the New Testament? Christ our Redeemer, Christ our Sanctuary, Christ our Sacrifice, Christ our Guide and our Reward, pointing to the King, the Servant, the Human and the Divine. These different aspects of Jesus' ministry and also His character, brothers and sisters. Uh, when Paul wrote to Timothy, he wrote in 2 Timothy 3 that all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfected, thoroughly furnished to every good work. So, what he's saying here, <clears throat> all Scripture. Now remember, Paul's writing here, at the, uh, and, and uh, my question to you would be, which part of the Bible, if, if, if you were to have a Bible, which part of the modern Bible today would Paul have had? The New Testament or the Old Testament? Paul only had access to what we now today call Old Testament Scriptures. And it's interesting to note that he says, referring to the Old Testament, look, all Scripture, in other words, the whole of the Old Testament is God-breathed and is suitable, it's profitable for doctrines, for a proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Brothers and sisters, just think about that for the moment. Think about the impact of that. If Christian churches today saw the Old Testament as suitable for their doctrines, and for their reproof, and for their correction. I think we might have a, a, a more... Um, how, uh, certainly the face of Christianity would change if Paul, what he's writing here, is actually correct. The whole of the Old Testament suitable for doctrines? I thought Christianity today takes doctrines from Acts. How many of the churches say, our church stems from Acts? Brothers and sisters, what about... Jesus' church stemmed from the Old Testament, so who are we to say that ours has to stem from the New Testament? We are going to be looking in this presentation at patriarchs walking in the sanctuary. The question is, did the patriarchs and biblical leaders walk through the sanctuary? Well, I'm going to list a couple here. We've looked at Moses already. We've, we've studied him, we've analyzed him, and I showed you his movement. What was that word? Movement through the sanctuary and how it took them 40 years from the Passover into Canaan, brothers and sisters. And we know that Joshua moved through into Canaan. So we'll have to look at him as well. But we're going to look at Adam and Eve, Abraham, Joshua, Paul, and today the Christian as well. Let's start with Adam and Eve. Question. If I go back to the sanctuary, which part of the sanctuary did Adam and Eve have access to? Which part of the sanctuary did Adam and Eve... Think about it now. Did they have access to the presence of God? Yes or no? Yes, they did. In fact, they were covered by the Shekinah glory. They were covered by the righteousness, the light of God. And when they sinned, boom! The light disappeared. And <clears throat> the, the, uh, all of a sudden, they... It's not they were naked... It's that they realized that they were naked. Have a look. Let's read together from Genesis 2. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he made a woman and brought her unto the man. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. These two individuals are walking in the presence of God. So what does that mean? Where do they have access to? Right into the most holy. Okay, so they, they were both naked and his wife were not ashamed. In other words, they did not realize that they were naked. Let's read on. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said that ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? 
And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Okay, so there's, there's many trees that we can eat from, but there's one tree over there that we specifically are not allowed to eat from, and that is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now something happens. Eve sees through her senses, she senses that the Lord's lying. She says, no longer it is written, put that behind me, it is now I experience or my feelings tell me. <laughs> The, the, it'll be good for food. So her senses overrides her cognitive thinking and Eve goes and eats of the fruit. Now the serpent said unto the woman, God's lying to you. You will not surely die because God knows that your eyes will be opened and you shall be as gods. We'll have to look at that later. Knowing good and evil. And she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. So here... Very important to see, a key point brothers and sisters, notice this. The eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And the, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So they literally are hiding. And Adam also, unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? So the Lord is teaching them here. Because you have sinned, something else has to die. Otherwise, you are going to have to die. Satan knew that the Lord wasn't just going to let sin disappear. And the, the Lord here starts teaching Adam and Eve about the plan of salvation. This is when he comes and says, somebody will come and bruise the head of the serpent. But he clothes Adam and Eve with skins, which means something had to die. Now this is the first time in the universe that death has been seen. Read this with me. When Adam, according to God's special directions, made an offering for sin, it was to him a most painful ceremony. With his hand, his hand must be raised to take life, which God alone could give, and make an offering for sin. It was the first time he had witnessed death. The first time he, Adam and Eve, he as Adam and his wife Eve, and the whole of Eden and the entire universe had witnessed death. Can you imagine as he sticks and he tears and the blood starts coming out? And he sees this, uh, this animal writhing in the death pangs. And the, he looks into the eyes of that little lamb. And the lamb's eyes fade as the life passes from it. Let's read on. As he looked upon the bleeding victim writhing in the agonies of death, he was to look forward by faith to the Son of God, who was the victim prefigured, who was to die man's sacrifice. Brothers and sisters, by Adam's deed, he was looking through his works. Please notice the connection of works and faith. Through his works, he was connecting by faith to Jesus. Can you see it? Uh, doesn't it say with the faith without works is dead? Right? So here Adam is combining works with his faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result, angels are put on the eastern side. Look at this. The Lord God said, Behold the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So he, Adam and Eve, have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life. The Lord drove the man out of the Eden and put on the east of the garden uh, uh, angels or cherubims with a flaming sword. Now please, I want to go uh, just now back to the sanctuary and I want to try and draw it for you. Because uh, it, it's very important to realize how even Adam and Eve and their separation from God is depicted in the sanctuary. There's two trees, right? And excuse my drawings, but this is a tree, right? There's a tree. This is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
There's another tree, right? And this is the tree of uh, everlasting life. That's an arrow, right? Everlasting life. Now the Lord says, because you've eaten of this guy, and now you want to come across and eat of this guy, I'm going to put a separation in between you, between this tree and you. Now, think about it for a moment. Adam and Eve are walking around. They've got access to the Most Holy. They literally get caught in, the, in this area out here. That Remember, this area belongs to Satan. And uh, they come under his power. They eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Positive and negative. They eat of this tree. And the Lord says to them, oops, there's a problem. And immediately after sin, the door closes between them, between the Lord and between Adam and Eve. You see, what closed is this section over here. This section shut down. And uh, they, all of a sudden, it's not that they all of a sudden were naked. It's that they realized that they were naked. They knew all of a sudden, because up to that point, they had been clothed by the righteousness of Christ. And when they sinned, because sin cannot be in the presence of God, boom, the door closes and, oh no, they're naked. Right. Now, when you look at the actual building of the sanctuary itself, this is depicted because it says in Exodus 26, 31 and 33, Thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims, shall it be made, and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and 